So here we are again with the pyramid of executive power. And once again, we have POTUS sitting at the pinnacle of the pyramid of executive power. Gotta love the alliteration. Now, you might notice a little difference between the other faces of the pyramid. So I like to call this the backside of the pyramid. And it operates a little bit different, okay? So you'll notice that the gap, the gap is there because the entities on this face of the pyramid are specifically placed here in order to be free from executive control, free from presidential control. So you'll notice that's what the gap symbolizes, is the additional structures that are put in place so that the president doesn't have as much control over this part of the pyramid, that it can operate independently of the president's wishes, all right? So what are the entities on this face of the pyramid? So let's start over here because we have some independent agencies. Now, on the other face of the pyramid, your independent agencies were there because they were outside of cabinet control. Okay, so they situated outside the cabinet, they presented their budget directly to the OMB, not to the secretary of one of the executive departments, okay? Now on this face of the pyramid, they're here because they are designed to be free from presidential control. Now, how that freedom occurs, we'll talk about in just a second, all right? Now, in addition, we have your regulatory boards and commissions, and these might be an agency that is a regulatory commission or a regulatory board. Now, this area are entities that are designed to regulate a sector of the economy, regulate a business, regulate an industry. And they primarily do so by creating regulations. Now this is that quasi legislative power that we talked about earlier. We know that the bureaucracy almost operates like its own little government. It makes and enforces rules and interprets them as well. Okay, at least some aspects of the pyramid do. And your regulatory commissions, your regulatory boards, that's exactly what they do. They create regulations, rules by which the business is to operate. And if the business violates those rules, then they have quasi-judicial power to issue fines. They meet out punishments. They determine whether or not a business has violated the rules and regulations established by the commission. Okay? And now some examples of regulatory boards and commissions is you have the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which creates the rules by which we buy and sell stocks and bonds, right? Okay. We also have the Federal Elections Commission. So sometimes they're regulating, uh, you know, a practice, a, a governmental practice. In this case, how we finance our campaigns. Okay. So if you violate campaign finance law, you're going to get in trouble with the FEC. All right. Now, another entity that is over on this side of the pyramid that is actually designed to be free from presidential and congressional control, we call government corporations. A good example is United States Postal Service or Amtrak, okay, which is the railway service in this country. Now, in this case, we have, um, it's, a, it's a publicly run corporation and it's designed because no private entity could ever really make it work, can make money by actually requiring that mail be delivered to every household in the United States. You might think, well, what about UPS, right? Well, yeah, but does UPS go to very rural Minnesota and ensure that mail gets there, whether there's snow, slate, sleet, rain, sun or shine, right? Okay, that mail's gonna get everywhere. That's like the, mo the motto of the United States Postal Service. Okay, and they ensure that that service is provided. We did have a private railway system at one point in time in the country, but it wasn't financially feasible for private companies to make money doing it. And it was seen as an essential service. So now if you travel by train, you are actually traveling by a government corporation. Just in case we ever need a railway system in the future, we will have one because the government is providing for, for us. Now the corporation itself is designed that they're supposed to be self-funding, but they often aren't. They often can't actually make the money to maintain that, so they're getting additional dollars from the government as well, okay? All right, so government corporations are on this face of the pyramid. Your regulatory boards and commissions are on this face of the pyramid. And some independent agencies, you know, you could say operate on both faces of the pyramid, like the Food and Drug Administration is still a part of the Health and um, Human Services Executive Department, but it is also designed to regulate the food industry and is designed to be free from presidential control. Before we talk about how the entities on this face of the pyramid, the backside of the pyramid are free from presidential control, 
let's remind ourselves of the tools the president has to control the bureaucracy. And you'll note that I tried to illustrate that because though these tools are limited in their effectiveness on this face of the pyramid, he uses the same tools to try to control this face as well. They're just not quite as effective. So I tried to illustrate that with this purple arm reaching around the gap to so that there is some presidential control. First off and foremost is the appointment power. So the president still has the power to appoint the leaders of the entities that exist on this face of the pyramid. The people in charge of regulatory boards and commissions, the people in charge of government corporations, the people in charge of independent agencies that exist on this side of the pyramid. The president does get to appoint them. Okay, so he has some control to shape the vision of these entities by putting people that align with his ideology, with his vision for the country in charge. He also can use reorganization. Now, again, that's not nearly as effective on this face of the pyramid as on the other face of the pyramid, where he can move you in and out and into different executive departments, give you cabinet rank position if he agrees with the mission of your agency, those types of chief administrator type tasks, right? Finally, there is the Office of Management and Budget. So the president can control to some extent what happens on this phase by having them submit their budget to the OMB and having the OMB you know, proof every proposed regulation, every proposed rule that is going to tell us how business, how the economy, how uh, industry is run in this country, okay? Now, so how do we create that freedom from presidential control? So primarily when these entities were created, Congress established some features of them that allow them to be free from presidential control. And these features I have listed over here. So first you have to understand that the heads of these entities, there's often gonna be a commission or board that governs the agency. And that commissioner board is gonna be made up of three or more people. So it's not just one person, it's three or more people. Now they still might be appointed by the president, but they're gonna have a fixed term and they're gonna have a staggered term. So if it's a commissioner board of three people as president, I might have the opportunity to appoint one person, okay? And then the other two aren't going to overlap with my term and they might be appointed by the president before me or the president after me. If I serve two terms as president, I might have the luxury of appointing two of the three people. But what if it's a board of seven? What if it's a board of 12, okay? Then I definitely don't get a chance to appoint everybody. Sometimes there's requirements that the board is made up of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. That's another way we free them from presidential control. Now, in addition, there's a big one here that sometimes the once appointed, that person can't be removed or fired, from, fired by the president. Okay? So that's another way to ensure freedom from that kind of control. So you got these things right here. The, the final one is that the budget, the oversight of the budget of these entities on this side of the pyramid is removed from control by the Office of Management and Budget. When you think, well then who, who controls their budget? Who oversees their budget? Probably Congress in that particular case does it directly. Okay, rather than having the intermediary of that entity that works for the president through the executive office of the president. All right? Okay. All right, so our topic continues to be the bureaucracy, which is essentially all the institutions that help the president execute the laws that have been passed by Congress. But just so you know, Congress does not cede complete control of the bureaucracy to the president. They do attempt to retain control, especially when Congress happens to be controlled by a different political party than the president. So how, as you can see, I have an image here that I've constructed between the two major faces of the pyramid, okay? And we got a little image here. You should recognize this as congressional power or congressional control. So how does Congress maintain control over the bureaucracy? Number, so we got some before the fact reasons, and we got some after the fact um, techniques that they use. So before the fact is before they actually control or create an agency, because we know that the bureaucracy itself has been created piecemeal over the time. If we started off 
you know, just with the main functions that a government would need to do with the creation of the departments of state, treasury, and war, which became the Department of Defense, right? And then as the needs of the nation changed, as the needs of various groups within the nation changed and developed, more elements were added to the bureaucracy over time. So when Congress gets to design or to structure an emerging new agency or executive department, there's a couple things they can do. They can decide which face they want to place the pyramid on. Do they want it to be you know, controlled by the presidency or do they want it to be independent of presidential control? So they get to decide that. They get to decide the leadership structure. Those are the before the fact ways that Congress control the bureaucracy. Now, after the fact, so they've done the creation, now they want to try to exercise some control over the bureaucracy after if it's already been created. Number one tool that they use is oversight. We know that there are committees that investigate to ensure that congressional law is being executed as Congress intended. So oversight's a big tool that Congress will use to control the various agencies, various corporations, various regulatory boards and commissions. Another tool that they will use is the budget. Yes, the president proposes the budget and the OMB helps the president construct the budget. And it's a huge tool for the president to control the bureaucracy, but ultimately the budget is passed by Congress. And if Congress disagrees with the president's budget, they can just not give them as much money as he requests or give him more money than he requests. An example from not too long ago was Special Olympics. The president proposed cutting the budget to Special Olympics and Congress said, no, we're gonna to continue to fund it, okay? And then we have termination. Now termination is a strategy that a Congress might use when they no longer see the need for a particular agency. They just end it, they cut it out of the budget. It doesn't exist anymore and they do that by law, okay? Another strategy, devolution. This you might remember from earlier in the year when we talk about returning the powers that have gone, that have gravitated to the national level, returning those powers to the states. So you might say this agency no longer, the mission of this agency isn't as effective from the national perspective, the national lens, and we're going to eliminate it and allow the states to create their own state level agencies. Or you look at that quasi legislative power and say regulations at the national level are a one size fit all. Why don't we devolve the power to make those particular types of regulations and rules onto the state so they can tailor them to the needs of industry and business in their states, right? So devolution is another tool that's within the realm of congressional control. Finally, we have privatization. They say, all right, we don't need government actually be, to be doing this task. Let's privatize it. Let, let's private entities take over this. When George Bush first came into office, he had the idea of privatizing social security. Now that didn't get much traction, it never happened, but it is an idea, it is a tool that's out there. Take what's publicly owned, what's run by the government, and privatize it. Let private industry, private companies, private individuals take care of that. All right, thanks for listening. All right, one last thing before we move on to a new topic entirely. Let's talk a little bit about communication, right? So we have the bureaucracy. And what we know here is that Congress and elements of the bureaucracy, whether it's a particular agency, an executive department, is going to be in constant communication. Now on the congressional end, that's going to take the form of one of your, your standing committees or maybe a subcommittee of a standing committee. If you're thinking Iron Triangle, you are correct. So that's what we're talking about here is kind of that theory about how you know, policy, laws of the nation is actually crafted. So I try to illustrate that here with these purple lines showing that there's a two-way communication between elements of the bureaucracy and congressional committees. If you really wanted to make it a little more realistic, we're going to move Congress towards you, right? So this is, you got one, one up part of the triangle is gonna be embedded in that pyramid. The other part of the triangle is out here. And the third part of the triangle might be up there, which is going to be an interest group, right? So what is the information that is being communicated both ways? 
Well, if we just look at this part first, so between the, the bureaucratic agency and a congressional committee, the bureaucratic agency is going to do certain things for the congressional committee. Okay, it's going to be providing information, technical information and support on that they might need to craft laws. They're also going to be providing casework help. So you remember that type of representation that a, a Congress person really likes to engage in because it gets them votes? Well, oftentimes that is going to be help with an element on the bureaucracy. So they're helping with the casework. They're the ones that actually kind of get the, the whatever it is that the constituent needs, they get it done over here. And that helps the Congress person get votes. So going this direction is that Congress is going to be supporting their budget requests. So these, everybody over here is advocating that they need money and Congress ultimately is gonna be giving them money. So what about the communication, you know, between the bureaucratic agency and an interest group? So the bureaucratic agency, again, is going to be providing technical information that supports that interest group's mission. The reverse end, what is the interest group going for the bureaucratic agency? They're going to be helping them with their clientele. Okay, making sure that the people that they're supporting, if they have a clientele group, that that interest group has the similar clientele group, that they're advocating for that particular government agency, its mission and its need to exist, because it's helping them out. So it's giving them that kind of political support on that end. The other thing that the bureaucratic agency is going to be doing for an interest group is uh, providing them favorable regulations, favorable favorable execution of the law, right? Execute in a certain way that helps that industry or helps that interest group. Regulations that don't hinder uh, it as much or maybe helps it achieve its mission and rules in that regard. So that's kind of what's information that is traveling this way here. Okay, well, what about the third one? What about between the, the interest group and Congress? What's happening there? So we studied this last minute but last unit, but ideally the Congress is going to providing favorable legislation to the interest group. What do they get in return? Well, they're going to be getting campaign donations, election support in the form of votes, but they also get critical information that they might not have the time, the energy, the expertise to actually gather themselves so that they can craft laws that are beneficial to the country. They're, you know, interest groups are testifying before these committees as well. Okay? They're advocating for their needs. So just remember that we are going to have, not only do we have our, our pyramid of executive power, which appears to be a triangle, but we're gonna have these lines of communication that create the iron triangle. If you want to get more advanced, you look at the issue network, okay?